Ushers, would you come? <clears throat> Let's see. Uh, because we're live streaming, we don't say names, but there's a young man, and it looks like a daughter here from Ely, and they're visiting for a second time. Seek them out and greet them after the service today. And um, ushers, you can go ahead and start. Carol has an announcement, and then she's also going to pray. Good morning. Good morning. Wonderful worship. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Let's work again. I'm here to promote it. I'm not going to read you a chapter this morning, but this morning we are going to hand one copy out to every family. I am so grateful that this book was brought to our attention because prayer is fundamental in our Christian walk for our own personal lives and for our lives corporately as a body. Um, the world is so dark today and God asks us to partner with him in his work. And as I said, prayer is fundamental and we need to, in order to see the, the kingdom advance, we need to partner with God in prayer. Any work we do on our own without the power of the Holy Spirit is useless. We're not going to touch people's hearts, their, their minds, their hearts for the Lord without the Holy Spirit. So I want to encourage you. These chapters are so short, you could read them in the morning over your cup of coffee for breakfast or at your break. Stick it in your purse and bring it to work and read it there. Uh, it might stir up a conversation with someone. But I would like uh, every family to get one. And then if there's extras, if you know of a family that's not here, you can grab it for them. But if there's extras, we're going to put them out in the foyer for a while uh, let them sit there for a little while until families who haven't got them gets them. And then after that, if you want to grab them after a couple of weeks, if you know someone that would use them, uh, go ahead, take it. So I will, let's pray. Praise you. Praise you, God. We worship you, Lord. We thank you for your presence here. You said where two or more are gathered in your name, Jesus. There you are in our midst. And we welcome you. We welcome you, Holy Spirit, to have your way here. Help us, Lord, to have ears to hear what your Spirit is saying to us individually and what you are saying to us corporately. Help us to leave you room in our life and in our service to, to let you have your way. So Holy Spirit, here we are before you. I think of you, Lord, that says, we don't know what to do, but our eyes are on you, Lord. Things are so dark. We don't know what to do, but we know what your word says, and we turn to your word, and we turn to your power, the work of your Holy Spirit here in this world today. So we we thank you for your word, and we welcome you, Holy Spirit. In the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Say, Pastor Bernie just came up to me with an urgent request. Um, yeah, I won't say the name, but someone's grandfather is just getting picked up by the ambulance and it doesn't look very good right now. Uh, just a quick comment to show how tender these things can be. Grandparents are special. 10% of all kids in America are raised by their grandparents. And that was the case for this person, largely raised by, I think maybe even great grandparents. but. Uh, in any event, let's pray. Lord, 
We've had some other ambulance situations recently that didn't look good in the natural. I was just prayed for that I would um, be able to, that the veil would be rent before me. And so Lord Jesus, I ask for your merciful touch upon this one and upon all that are hurting and, and concerned. Lord, I pray this storm like we just talked about, you know the name of every wave. And when you say be still, they go flat. And so we say peace, be still to this storm in Jesus' name. Amen. Our sister Pat's going to read scripture today. And uh, Pat, would you dismiss the kids then after that as well? Or I'll dismiss the kids now. Kids, you can stand up and your teachers are ready to receive you. On the count of three, Annalena gave us this years ago. On the count of three, one, two, three. I love Jesus. Good morning. We're going to be in the Word, um, John, chapter 4, verses 19 through 26. The woman said to him, Sir, I believe that you are, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, and you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place where one ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. You know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. I was uh, just prayed for that the veil would be torn, and it was kind of specific to me. So I want to, um, by calling attention to myself, I guess I actually want to humble myself under that. Uh, Heavenly Father, it's certainly been perplexing for a long time. So many different directions are called for. What's the way forward? And things that in the natural seem impossible and actually going in different directions somehow with divine wisdom I believe can come together because nothing shall be impossible with God. And so I do ask that you would give clarity to us all. But for the clarity that I need in this hour, in Jesus' name, amen.
you guys, what a, an amazing passage. It's the woman at the well story. We just took a little slice of it. Uh, people that study these things say it is one of the most commonly read and appreciated stories, true story in all the Gospels. And isn't it beautiful? A woman who had had five marriages fall apart for whatever reason, we don't know, and was then living with another outside of marriage. Jesus comes in. And, um, and someone that would have been considered a social outcast as well as a Samaritan. To choose, Jesus comes in with a powerful, personal, tender invitation to have all her hunger satisfied and all her thirst taken away and to be filled with his Holy Spirit and be saved. But somewhere in there, she breaks into this little side discussion about worship, which is our focus today. What an amazing passage of scripture. Just by way of introduction, what God wants. In fact, it's stronger than that in our text. See it, it's what he seeks. God who doesn't need anything really. It's wholly self-sufficient. But yet he seeks something on a basis of desire. He seeks worshipers and a type of worship as told to us. And the confidence that we can have in this word, it is conveyed and communicated by no less than his own son who knows him as one and by the power of the Holy Spirit. In the Old Testament, what God wanted in worship took chapters and chapters. It was fine detail, minute, strict um, areas to comply in, chapter upon chapter. But what does he say here? What does he say with the new covenant approaching? He doesn't mention a single external means of worship, not one. And the one that is proposed to him, he canceled. It is surprising, maybe not as much to us, but if you were a Samaritan or a Jew, that would have been more than surprising. That would have been shocking, what Jesus just said. But excuse me, he really did ask for one instrument, a very specific instrument to be used in worship. And that instrument is us. Us. Born again by the Spirit back into Christ. Uh, water baptism and outward reflection of an inward act. When we're born again, we don't often think of it as a baptism, but our regeneration, our being born again, is our death, burial, and resurrection in the Spirit. You, a born again, new birth, baptized by the Spirit, into his son, adopted child of God is what he seeks. And as to the how-tos, as to the how-tos, nothing external is mentioned here in the ultimate sense. Nothing external is mentioned. 
But as to how to, he said, in spirit. Now, I'll unpack that, but that's by a new heart, by a born again, resurrected from the dead heart. And as to truth, as a lover of the truth, as manifested in the truth, Jesus Christ, the one who can ultimately show us the Father. Introduction. So backing up just a little context. So woman at the well, Jesus doing personal evangelism, uses his gift of prophecy to lay bare her heart, though tenderly merciful, and offering salvation, and yet intensely convicting. Uh, the word does say about prophecy, doesn't it, that it uh, um, lays bare our hearts. He laid bare her heart. She abruptly, if you read the text in Fomus, diverts attention away from that awkward moment and starts a conversation on the topic of worship. But you can't stymie Jesus. He answers, but he stays on point. Now a little word study. See it in verse 20. Look there. Uh, I think in the first sense, it's in the past tense, eris, worship up. In the next reference in verse 20, it's worship. Um, it's not a badge of honor that I read. Uh, in fact, I just got a new version of the Bible this week, so I now read these texts in 25 versions. Um, but, but actually, that's not a badge of honor. I would trade all but one of them. I would, like one in English, but I would trade them all if I knew Greek. That's just my compensation for that. Nevertheless, the Greek word there for worship, it means what? It means to bow and to prostrate. Prostrate, yes. As in humble, in a humble honor. <clears throat> but isn't worship synonymous with music and singing? In other words, like, didn't we just do worship? And this is all something else right now. That is really how not all the Christian world thinks of it, but non-denominational largely, evangelical, Pentecostal, charismatic. You ask most what's worship, they would say, well, it's the music and the singing. But even for those types of denominations, which we are, that was only true since about the 70s with the Jesus people. A revival, a glad revival, grateful for it, burst so many things. But really, only until that, or not until that time, was worship and music considered synonymous. This would have been more the idea of worship for all those other 1950 years. Worship is to bow the heart and possibly the body in humble, dependent, loving, adoring, glad submission and reverence to God's holy, awesome greatness, but not just his greatness, also his goodness. Amen? Worship, hear me, it's not less than music. 
It's not what I'm suggesting. But worship properly understood is more than music. And that's a good thing. Why is that a good thing? Because then everything can be worship. Everything can be worship. Eating, drinking, work, relationships, Bible, fellowship, prayer, giving. Because when we do those things with a heart of proskuneo, that's the Greek word, when we do those things with a bow of dependence in God, with a bow of honor towards God, with a bow of, I want to do this relationship by your standard, Lord. It becomes worship. And that's beautiful. That opens up all of life to worship. Amen. But there are how-tos of worship. There's ways that worship manifests, if you will. And yet I'm going to use the word also here, worship wars. And the reason I'm going to use worship wars is not to be difficult, but you see it there in verse 20. Look at verse 20 again. We come by them honestly. I mean, they're right there recorded for us in the Bible. Is it Mount Gerizim? As the Samaritan suggested, or is it Mount Zion in Jerusalem? Which is it? Beloved, that was an intense deal for them. Okay? Seems silly to us now. That for them was blood earnest. Blood earnest. But I use that word again, worship war, one, because it's become a bit of a catchphrase. So it kind of has a meaning all of its own. It's become a catchphrase for theologians. Now, a lot of us like to cancel them, but it's not just theologians. It's uh, little pastors of little congregations with boards trying to figure this stuff out. So there's lots of opinions about it. And it's something for worship leaders to navigate. And uh, the catchphrase is that we get embroiled in worship wars, trying to figure out different desires. And the second reason I use it is because people do bring some intense passion about those kind of things. It matters to people. It matters deeply to people. How worship is conveyed. Now, sure, Mount Zion and Gerizim has been settled for us. Jesus settled it in a verse. When you have his authority, boy, you can figure things out quickly. <laughs> you can decree it. And location went from where? The tabernacle in the wilderness to the temple in Jerusalem to the synagogues in Judea and outer, outer places, and eventually it came to the church, right? Now say yes and no. Yes, yes and no. Yeah, that's, that's, it's partly true and it's partly not. Why? Because again, here's some good news. First Corinthians 3.16. Someone asked me, why do you say all the 316s are great? Well, one, they're all the word of God, but sometimes they really do stand out. 1 Corinthians 3.16, do you not know? Beloved, think of me. Think of this. Do you not know that you are God's what? His temple. Oh, that, that, that's a whole sermon. And that God's spirit dwells in you. 
What else can we say? In fact, Carol prayed it. That was beautiful. Matthew 18, 20, where two or three are gathered in my name. There am I among them. The Spirit of Christ is present. And so what that means, what that means is that wherever you're born again, child of God treads, becomes holy ground. And yet millions of Christians still are trying to sort out uh, another question of the how-tos of worship. Like one of the major things they're trying to sort out right now is do I need the church to worship? Or can I just go it alone or with a handful of close friends? That is a huge, huge thing that millions of people are trying to decide right now. And it's not our subject for today, but what does the Bible say? Both public and from house to house, at least that principle. The fact is, some controversies have been thankfully solved for us. I think it maybe it'll smile even just a tiny bit. But some worship wars have been solved for us. Uh, one of them was the love feast or agape feast and the spiritual communion. Early on, worship started with a full meal or ended with a full meal, usually ended, ended with a full meal, at the end of which was a second spiritual meal that we now call communion. They fought over whether you can separate the two. Now, the fact of the matter is one of the reasons I often initiate potlucks during communion is to bring them back together because it's beautiful. But they don't have to be together. And most of the Christian world has separated them, haven't they? How about this one? Worshiping on Saturday or Sunday. Blood earnest over that question. That doesn't seem to hit our rate, our screen with passion. That was a big deal for worshipers of another era. How about should worship be in Latin or the common tongue of the people? It seems like a no-brainer to us, doesn't it? Wars fought over that question. Oh, This was a war. Only choirs can sing in the worship service versus the whole congregation can open their voice in song. Sounds silly to us. Wars fought over that. One of the reasons I kind of say those is because we have our own today that we feel more passionate about. But I just think with a little bit of humility, some maybe 20 years from now or 200 years from now, should God tarry, they'll look back and say, well, that was kind of silly. That's a little bit silly. That relationships were ruined and people were at loggerhead and there was division over questions like, oh my goodness, they will say in future generations. That said, we have questions, don't we? How much order should there be in worship? Now the Bible talks about that, 1 Corinthians 14.40. And yet, how much spontaneity should there be in worship? The Bible talks about that, 1 Corinthians 14, 26. And how about the length of a worship service? Early church, they met all day. All day. All Sunday. In fact, I was reading accounts that said they read the scripture for three hours. And that was just part of their worship. 
scripture reading for three hours, full meal together, sermons, countless prayers. How long should a worship service be? How about the thing we talked about last week? I think that's one of the desires is to see this balance. Balancing the idea that Jesus had a ministry of teaching. Jesus had a ministry of touching or the laying down of band. And then there's the question of physical expressions in worship. Those are just some of them. This is where much of the passion lies, strong feelings about the how-tos of worship, when in fact the Bible gives us broad sideboards with tons of freedom in between to express ourselves, which mostly works out to cultural preferences. But with the remainder of our time, let's look at how Jesus answers the woman at the well's question about the outward form of worship. Now, just summarizing verses 21 and 22, really broad brush. Jesus is saying, and, and I can't fully defend this, but this is a summary comment. You Samaritans have the wrong place. And you have the wrong ideas or object of worship. Your zeal is for your father's plural. And what he was saying is your zeal about worship is for your tradition, for the honor of your culture, for the honor of your people. But the Jews, they have the right place and they have the right idea of the coming Messiah, but too often their worship lacks your zeal and your heart. Moreover, on top of those true ideas, they've added extra ideas that are wholly self-serving. And so they're beholden to their tradition. And so what's true worship? And so then he quickly goes to this, is coming, yea, it is already here. That now, not yet tension. And so what then is true worship? from Jesus' own mouth, representing his Father's seeking heart. It's essentially two things, two things. And the reason I wanted to start a series of messages on worship here is because if we miss that, we can gain the whole world of everything else and lose our soul, and lose true worship. Amen. So true worship, what is it? Jesus uses the word Father. Again, that's a, a lot that goes into that. So just take me on face, love, uh, face value. But it seems like he's doing a bit of a wordplay to his advantage. You talk about the fathers, you Samaritans. You Jews talk about the fathers fathers and the rabbinic tradition and I'm talking about the father what he sees you see that twice in verse 23 and Jesus is saying the father is the object of worship for Samaritans and Jews you're mostly caught up in the zeal for the fathers or your tradition, not the father, singular. Now that idea of fathers has more meaning. It also means this. The father wants his children to worship him. And the father-child imagery 
is primarily what? It's primarily relational, right? It's primarily relational. Um, it's not foremost about form or ritual. The Father wants his kids to worship him, which connotes love and honor. Specific manifestations, I would grant, I would, I would uh, suggest, vary from kid to kid. Can you imagine the one kid goes to worship the father, love on the father, honor the father, and the sibling says, "You're not doing it right." Oh my goodness! Just think how hurtful that would be. Now that's not anointed the way you're doing it. That be hurtful, and when you think about the fact that it's the father and his children, I would suggest to you that the father leaves some room in worship for individual personalities. There's not just a right and only way. The Bible shows us that, and church history shows us that. There's broad sideboards. There's general elements that get manifested in manifold different ways according to culture and personality and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There's a second thing about true worship. In terms of how-tos, the how-tos that the Father seeks and requires are that it's in spirit and in truth. Do you see that in verse 23 and 24? It's like Jesus is saying, if you must reduce the question to how-tos, I'll play along. But it's this, the Father seeks those that will worship him in spirit and in truth. What does that mean? What does that really mean? It means this. Uh, again, I can only give the summary, not the detail. But when he says that God is spirit and he must be worshipped in spirit, it's the idea that you can't worship unless you're Holy Spirit enabled. Spirit to spirit, deep to deep. It's that idea. In other words, spirit as a foremost meaning there means you can't even rightly spirit or worship until you're born again, regenerate, your fallen spirit and nature has been resurrected and become a living spirit sealed by the Holy Spirit and that the passion for worship has to come from within before it's manifested without, not the other way around. A true worshiper can worship God anointedly, anointedly in many forms. Well, no, there's really just one anointed way to do worship, Jim. And I know, I, I'm told that a lot, but it doesn't hold up to the Bible. And you know this to be true if you do the math. Well, I mean, we'll do it together. Um, the reason an anointed, uh, reason worship can be anointed in many forms is because the anointing isn't with the external, the anointing is with the worshiper. 1 John chapter 2, verse 20. You have an anointing. It's carried by you. And when you exercise that anointing with a soft heart, you can find a way to worship God in a lot of different ways. Yes. 
What does the truth mean? Well, the truth means, ultimately, the Messiah. And we see that further. Because he is the truth. John 14, verse 6, and alone manifests knowingly. He alone has the ability to manifest knowingly the Father to us. 2 Thessalonians, verse 10. So what does that mean then? Is there a secondary sense of truth? Well, there is, but it's derivative. It can't be disconnected from the truth, Jesus. Love of the truth, Jesus. There's no biblical worship if there's no ultimate love to Jesus. But there's a derivative sense in which then that worship has to do with God's holiness, his worthness, his attributes, his excellencies, and the revelation of the Father given to us by the Son through the Holy Spirit. It has everything to do with the perfections and excellencies of God. You want to elevate worship, elevate your understanding of the glories of God. And spirit has a secondary sense as well. Spirit then derivatively means worship is inwardly generated. It must be inwardly generated. It must come from the heart. It has to well up from the heart. The new heart. The new heart and spirit are the same in the Bible. That new regenerate spirit has to come from the new man, if you will, inwardly generated if it will be authentically manifested outwardly. Boy, it needs to be given expression. Don't hear me say it doesn't be, need to be given a mosaic of different beautiful expressions. Prayer, m music, giving, kindness, fellowship, all kinds of things. But it needs to come from the heart, not outwardly to us. Worship is own, and maybe to say it boldly, or at least to get you to think, in, in a sense, worship is only inside in one sense. And where I'm going with this, I want to be careful. It's only inside in one sense. In other words, word and song and hands and amen and 20 more things are the vehicles that carry true worship more than they are the worship themselves in and of themselves. But a beautiful part of it, it's just like grace through faith. Grace is the electricity. Faith is the electrical cord. You need both. Both are beautiful, but we do well to understand how they're different. It's why Jesus called the outward form, no matter how beautifully, pageantly expressed outwardly, he said the outward form, if it's not carried by an inward heart, is vain, void, empty, meaningless, in the eyes of the ultimate beholder himself even if our feelings are really stirred up. So in conclusion, and someone else is going to call to the altar today, in the coming weeks, we're going to consider questions of biblical form. And I have a soft heart for it. I feel the longings that people are saying. I do get that. And we're going to look at these things with a really soft heart. There's a wonderful and fuller variety of worship experience that can be had. And let's look at it. Let's look at it. But today and foremost, the question is this. Do you believe? And this question is often more telling. It strikes us in a different way. But do you 
worship the Father? That's a question. Do you worship the Father? Because only a spirit born in Christ believer can biblically and properly be said to worship or at least worship rightly. Are you born again? Do you have the spirit of the living God within you? Well, yes, I do. And then a final question. I do, Tim. I know I do. I do, but still, a lot of times I don't feel it in worship. Is that ultimately the fault of the external form? Maybe we can do things to provide a fuller experience. We can. But when we don't feel it, the first place we need to look is are we grieving that Holy Spirit within us? Because when we're grieving the Holy Spirit within us, it's tough to feel much good of anything. And then the question isn't to add all kinds of new expressions, though we may do some of that. But the ultimate question then is to get right with that Holy Spirit within us and to begin fellowshipping with him again with a soft heart in love towards one another. Because he cares about how we treat one another. Amen. So, uh, Mark is going to call us to the altar, Dan. Um, uh, keep us live stream until Mark is through and then go off live stream. But you can start some music. scriptures. Thank you, Pastor Tim. Worship is multifaceted, and as Carol talked about prayer, that's one of the facets of worship, and we're going to end with prayer today. I'm going to read a couple scripture verses about prayer. James chapter 5, 13 through 18. This is a New Living Translation. Are any of you suffering hardships? You should pray. Are any of you happy? You should sing praises. Any of you sick? You should call for the elders of the church and come and pray over you, anointing you with oil in the name of the Lord. Such a prayer offered in faith will heal the sick, and the Lord will make you well. And if you have committed any sins, you will be forgiven. Confess your sins one to another and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. Elijah was as human as we are, and yet when he prayed earnestly that no rain would fall, none fell for three and a half years. Then when he prayed again, the sky sent down rain and the earth began to yield its crops. Colossians chapter 4 verses 2 through 6. Devote yourselves to prayer with an alert mind and a thankful heart. This is the Apostle Paul saying this. Pray for us too that God will give us many opportunities to speak about his mysterious plan concerning Christ. That is why I'm here in chains. Pray that I will proclaim this message as clearly as I should. Live wisely among those who are not believers and make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be gracious and attractive so that you will have the right response for everyone. A lot of you know me, many of you probably don't, but 36 years ago, I started my walk with the Lord in this place. 
and many of the things that I faced in those early years seemed like insurmountable life challenges. But God met me here and many, many, many times we gathered in front in prayer for me, for others, and many lives have been changed and touched and we want to see God continue to move in our lives, in my life, in your lives, in all of our lives as we gather here in prayer. So join us, anyone who has a need, anyone who has a praise report they want to um, pray with each other about, gather forward if you have a desire and a need, and God will meet us here. Thank you, Lord.